Climate change is a very big topic and it's going to take the work of every community and every nation around the world to really make an impact and try to, to, try to save what we do have here in our own communities now. Climate change is inevitable. Adaptation is optional. What we're here to talk about today are the options that we can go through, the kind of things we need to do, what, how do we guide people as few of us as there are who are really into this and working on these issues, we have to find a way to take the strength that we have and really be able to use those traditional teachings and use those things that are part of our spirituality. We have to use that to help guide the rest of humanity if we and they are going to survive. I guess generally as a weather pattern in our community, probably looking more at like the, the storm events being much more larger, yeah, more um, flooding, but then there's long kind of drought periods in between. So there's not a more a regular set of precipitation, whether it be rain or snow in the winter time. It all kind of comes in bunches and then nothing. Um, I know last year it was uh, rain. We had a lot of rain and then so it flooded a lot of our crops and we had a poor season and then that, and it got cold quick, so it was really hard on our on our crops last year in particular. Um, this year, we're happen to be faring a little bit better, a little bit more regular rain events rather than storms. And then um, had pretty pretty decent weather this year for our, our crops. And then as it um, climate change also affects of that is um, our health, our tribal members' health. We have a lot more higher incidences of uh, respiratory illnesses and um, also asthma is kind of on the climb and kind of a lot of that could be contributed to the greenhouse gases that are and smog you know as we live here on the Oneida reservation or right on the Green Bay city of Green Bay comes onto our reservation but a lot of that um, pollution comes from lar much larger cities further to the west of us in different states even like Minneapolis you know St. Paul Minnesota. The biggest impact that I've seen within my community uh, with climate change is um, drought. We've, we've, um, our winters have become uh, less uh, moisture, less snow, uh, less rainfall in the spring. Um, the glaciers in, in the mountains that we have are reducing. So that's the, that's the biggest uh, um, climate change that I see going on within our area. So some of the stuff we try to do when we educate our community, our organization, is let them know climate change is a long-term. Climate is long-term, weather is short-term. So some of the things that's unique to Oneida, where we'll be next to Green Bay, Wisconsin, is we have a lot of infrastructure. We have buildings, we have um, drainage systems, we have a wastewater treatment plant. So one of the unique things about Oneida is we need to protect our infrastructure from the changes in climate the changes that the climate is going to bring, increased rain events, um, increased strength of storms. We have to make sure our infrastructure is um, protected. Unique to other tribes that may be more rural in nature that are dealing with other issues. That's, uh, I think, a unique thing to Oneida that we need to do. One of the things that I think that we're missing here is the importance of our white corn and the importance of our food and trying to tie that together. So we talk about even decolonization from what I'm gathering and learning and being around people of all color is that that decolonization happens with our language and with our food. So when we talk about climate change, when we talk about some of the, some of the issues that we're having, so if you look at Jinkingo as, as a program within this structure here, it's one of the main programs that is pounding out the white corn. Amazing, yes, yes, definitely amazing. So when something happens like weather, you know, something happens like pest, so we didn't deal with the, the corn boar worm last year, but we're dealing it with this year. Last year we dealt with the freeze. This year we're dealing with, dealing with warmer temperatures. We have a farm that we're developing. Uh, we've, uh, we've established it as, a, as an organic farm with about three acres at this point. But working in the soil uh, and walking the entire property and, and knowing it really well by now, um, I've noticed that there's, uh, when, the, when the rain uh, bursts come, 
it, it's, uh, there was plenty of rain, but they, it, they, the force of the raindrops hitting or coming in was really quick. Uh, it, it's like it hit hard and then left. But the force, the force part of the rain uh, and the wind with it, 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 it seemed like it, uh, it bent over the corn. It, uh, it just had more intensity than previous seasons. The U.S. and Cuba are going to do offshore drilling possibilities uh -huh. today. It's not looking good. And then I run into, um, the same back and I run into um, Patricia. And then on the bottom, on the Hurricane Patricia, and then on the bottom, it's about the refugees. And they're refugees for climate change. Like my brother and I were talking, they're refugees of climate change. That can happen to us. And all of these are warnings. All of these are clear signs of what we're living. And so I don't think it's looking good, but I do have hope. And I think it's looking good because our tribal nations, our communities are acting. I think primarily we have drought conditions um, in our uh, area, in our region. Um, we've we've had some flooding in the past couple of months, or back in, in the month of June. But since then, we've reverted back to the drought conditions. We don't we don't have enough rainfall. In addition, we have some uh, the natural disasters, the tornadoes, and and uh, those types of things, earthquakes that uh, the tremors that uh, have not really caused extensive damage in my area. But they're they're really areas of concern because uh, who knows when the next one's going to be. A major one. Well, I represent the Columbia River Intertribe Fish Commission, and we represent the uh, four treaty tribes that fish along the Columbia River. Um, with the uh, global warming and the lack of snowfall, the um, low river flows in the tributaries. Um, it's going to really affect our fishermen because of the uh, seventy degree water is really bad for our salmon, and. Uh, the salmon that do, did survive this summer, they go to their tributaries where their homelands and there's lack of spawning uh, water there. And the ones that do get there, if there's a spawning ground, then they have no water flow to get down the river. So it's uh, really uh, gonna be really a, a detrimental and it's it started. When I was a kid growing up, we had uh, rains and snows that we could depend on all the time. But uh, then the two power plants came into our neighborhood that burn uh, high sulfur coal. And now we, we're in a drought and we don't get the rains and the snows that we used to. And uh, when I was growing up, we could see all kinds of flowers all, all through, the, all through the, the desert areas, uh, all kinds of colors. But now it's just brown. And uh, the wind comes, and the, there's a lot of movement with the with the sand. A lot, a lot of the topsoil has uh, blown off. And uh, now we grow corn, and uh, it's it's half the size that it used to be. So we know that the impact of uh, climate change is really adversely impacting our our livelihood, our our farming, our agriculture, and uh, it's just uh, hurting everything. For the, the Menominee, where we have a, a forest that's been something that sustained us over, over many generations, whether it was through subsistence, hunting, gathering, um, or the more recent um, sustainable forestry management. So the majority of our reservation is forested and it's managed for um, timber resources which go through our sawmills. So this has been a, a large part of our community for over a hundred years now. Um, one of the things that, that I see just as a tribal member and working in, in this area has been that <clears throat> there are so many issues impacting our forest, the diversity of tree species that we have. Um, we see um, invasive species are probably something that more people notice right away because the impacts are more noticeable, defoliation, um, just trees dying from, from different insects and disease. 
but the question of how does climate change um, accelerate or impact these these issues that's something that we're currently uh, working on trying to figure out. Well, I think uh, we're looking at uh, our comprehensive strategic planning, how that incorporates climate change issues that are going on. And then that's related, of course, to our safety planning and our emergency planning. So the theory is the better strategic comprehensive plan you have, the better safety plan you have, the better emergency plan you have, and less issues as, as they connect. The International and the Treaty Council was founded in 1974. <coughs> out of a lot of period of turmoil uh, where indigenous peoples, American Indians were standing up for our rights in the United States with marches across the country, takeovers of the BIA building, armed standoffs that wounded me, um, the occupation of Alcatraz Island, uh, fishing rights struggles, and many other ways that uh, did not get the response that we had hoped for from the United States government. In fact, uh, a lot of repression happened. Leonard Peltier is still in prison uh, to this day from, from that time. And in 1974, the International Indian Treaty Council was formed on Standing Rock Reservation in South Dakota uh, with a decision um, that was based on the instruction of the elders to find a voice internationally to address our rights, um, including our treaty rights as nations. Uh, and that place was the United Nations. So in 1977, the International Indian Treaty Council, or IITC for short, um, was the first indigenous organization uh, to get what's called consultative status um, with the United Nations Economic and Social Council. And in 2011, we we're the only indigenous organization to be um, elevated to what's called general consultative status. But the good news is uh, we started out by ourselves in that work and now thousands of indigenous peoples, nations, tribes, communities, and organizations from literally every continent and um, every hemisphere of the world are participating in those international discussions, including the one that we're going to talk about today, which is uh, the, the international United Nations work on climate change. What does that mean? <laughs> it means that these greenhouse gases are going up, they know it's dangerous, and we have to try to bring them down. Basically, that, that's what it's about. We're, we're just producing too much carbon uh, in a way that, that um, the earth cannot sustain, sustain this, at least for us to be around. Indigenous peoples would be at risk of loss of land and cultural natural heritage and cultural practices embedded in livelihoods uh, would be disrupted. So they know right now if that temperature goes up beyond that 1.5, it's going to it's going to affect our peoples, uh, not only here in North America but around the world. And especially what I want to stress is the urgency, right, of, of pressuring states. So we need folks to be writing letters, to be uh, writing uh, letters to head of state, to uh, at, the, at the national level, etc. And uh, through the Treaty Council, we're looking forward uh, to working with any of you on these issues to really and, and try to find creative ways to keep pressuring. Uh, not only the United States, but Canada and everyone else. It's a real pleasure to be able to introduce you today, and I'm looking forward to your message. Thank you. How do you educate, how do you instruct 7.3 billion people as to their relationship to Europe? Because if you don't understand that relationship, we are part of nature, that we are part of the environment then we will suffer. It's been my experience, my understanding is that nature uh, has no mercy. It only has rules and law. And you apply those rules and law for something. Prayers and things like that are, are important and should be continued. Our, our personal conduct and how we affect the yeah. environment around us um, um, will determine how we, how we survive and how our children uh, will, will manage the coming years. Um, I think it's very important that we really um, take a hard look at it and figure out what is best um, to slow down climate change. I think we're probably beyond the point where 
Um, you could stop it. I don't think that's reasonable at this point, but trying to mitigate those, um, those changes, you know, the greenhouse gas emissions and the such that um, they should be um, rolled back and alternative energy really invested in as a, as a, uh, you know, a nation, United States, you know, really investing in that, you know, the solar and the wind that we do have here and kind of um, maybe slow down those subsidies on the um, fossil fuels and the such so that we have uh, that the whole nation as a whole is leaning towards, you know, green energy and energy efficiencies also has a lot to do with um, our energy consumption in this, in the United States. So would, I would really like to see some more um, money put towards efficiencies also, whether that be better insulating the homes or um, higher, you know, mileage out of the vehicles or, you know, mandating higher efficiencies of, you know, home furnaces, you know, changing the light bulbs, you know, there's so much simple things that we can do as an individual that have a uh, great impact on the environment. I guess the big picture is that we can do all we want. We can do restoration projects that perhaps reduce the amount of carbon, but until that faucet is turned off, nothing that we do is going to make a difference. So I'd like to see the United States become the world leader we are in many different areas in climate change, in reducing carbon, reducing fossil fuel usage, and having a plan for the future. What are we going to do? We look to the government, I guess, to guide us and say this is where we're going to be in the future. Uh, I think to at least to at least hear hear our voice that this is a uh, this is a uh, it affects our people, it's our traditional food, it's our traditional, uh, with uh, the foods that we eat, uh, it affects our traditional berries that we pick, and it's just something that really needs to be aware, and that, you know, with these fossil fuels, we can reduce that somehow. The United States needs to be more proactive in, uh, in being aware of un and understanding the impacts of uh, climate change. It needs to sign on as a participating uh, country government because uh, and show the leadership that it's, it's supposed to be uh, throughout the world and uh, coming to terms with uh, uh, carbon, uh, carbon burning and uh, just, just uh, doing all they can to protect the future of our of our children. Bigger push for uh, getting the word out to everybody of how important and how um, devastating you know it's going to be to to the world and to just all of us. Pass the laws and rules and regulations that uh, will affect some positive results uh, and I think also uh, the United States all our allowed tribes um, to uh, develop those rules and regulations and, and environmental rules uh, that affect their, their lands. They, they're closest to the lands that they, they operate and, and uh, live on. And uh, so they ought to have um, equal protection and rights just as states do under the laws. There's things that we can do locally that we should do locally that's, that's important because this is as we've heard different speakers and have been to different meetings, the, the common refrain is it, it's our, a common issue. It, it impacts us all. And so we have an individual responsibility. We have a, a communal responsibility in the place, um, the communities that we're part of, but also it's larger than that. There, there's so much um, development and emphasis on globalization, uh, making us a large global community that it is necessary for uh, nations, the United States, um, to do, th do something. It's necessary for forums like the United Nations to come together to do something. And so it's important across all of those levels. It's no longer an issue that can be addressed at um, just a few or, or one of these levels. The, the one other point I, I guess I have uh, of concern is the, the role of the non-governmental organization in relationship to the government organizations. Um, there's certainly Treaty Council as the NGO has a key role. Uh, the Indigenous Environmental Network has a role. Honor to Earth from an Indigenous standpoint have uh, different roles. And then the non-Indian community has their own NGOs, the uh, Extreme Energy Coalition, for example, uh, 
And then again, back just as one example on the issue of climate change, you know, where is this energy coming from? Where is it going? Uh, the the non the indigenous community with NCAI National Congress of American Indians uh, to a regional level with the Midwest Alliance of Sovereign Tribes to the, to the state level of Great Lakes Inter Tribal Council to the Oneida Nation Council. You know, there's a concept of relationship there that certainly could be enhanced and I believe is maximized when there's a better communication and relationship between all of those. The Creator intended that there be a balance in all of nature, but today the equilibrium of the world is precariously out of balance. The bursting of toxic waste into our life-giving rivers is a message we cannot ignore. The unmitigated exploitation of the world must end. The damage done to the earth by this exploitation must be repaired. The changing conditions of the world we cannot ignore. The pollution, the drought, the raging wildfires, the melting glaciers, the rising oceans, and the ever-increasing scarcity of water the world over. It is urgently imperative that we protect our waters. It's about making sure that we have our traditional corn so that we stay true to our ceremonies because the cycles are now changing where our green corn stage is not hitting our green corn ceremony. And, and there's some barter in there, I'm sure, that is happening. And so we have to, that's a big climate, <laughs> climate change issue, you know, that we have to face. And so again, I think, uh, how we need to change that and how we need to protect that is by having more growers. Really, what if toxicity in the environment was a crime? One of the ways that um, we can enforce that is by holding corporations and entities that pollute accountable. And that's something that Treaty Council does at the international level. I hope that the United States and the United Nations contributes to promoting policy of ecological integrity as a primary mo model to reverse climate change, or one of the primary models, instead of selling credits. We cannot take those solutions of selling credits. Our hope is that we can get all of our departments, all our divisions we're going to try to start thinking about climate change. How are you going to plan according to climate change projections? What's going to happen? What's going to be the impact to our health center? When we have an increase in invasive species and different diseases that come with that, what crops should we plant? What trees should we plant? What school, what areas of study should our kids be in? Climate change is going to have an impact on all of this stuff, not just environmental, but everything that we do. Well, I think uh, our environmental um, department has done a, a lot of great um, informational, getting stuff out there to our community members and offering programs for having um, our, their energy efficiency of their homes tested um, and then putting a lot of going after grants for our tribal buildings we own several buildings to make them more efficient you know mm -hmm. switching over uh, the lighting and even the parking lot lighting going to you know much more efficient um, lighting in the parking lots instead of using the old uh, metal halide lights and stuff like that which which is a, a great cost up front, but then in, in the long run, you're saving money um, from your energy costs and then also you're, you know, like mm -hmm. reducing the need for that additional electricity. So you're hopefully reducing the coal, that's what we have here, coal burning electrical plant here in Green Bay. So if we can lessen that demand, I mean, that's less coal that has to be burned and less uh, emissions that have to come out of that plant. I heard, uh one of our uh, spiritual leaders, at, uh, Oren Lyons, he, he was saying there almost has to be these zones that you declare. You're gonna have to uh, tell people, we need this much space to protect our little farm because all this uh, toxic uh, floating stuff can come in and then and guess what, it's in our field. So uh, we, uh, so the climate thing there is uh, you, uh, we need to protect uh, everybody else's stuff from coming over to your farm. 
and what and watch out what type of seeds you use uh, we need to share our seeds and bring our seeds back so that they're tough and resilient and and, and we can get our our seeds to grow again I guess in, in my community we can look at um, doing less of, of um, the big uh, oh, industries I guess it that a lot of us, you know, in, in our country maybe think about doing for economic reasons, but uh, if you look at the devastation of, of it in the long run, I guess we need to look at IC as, as um, looking more to what we can use naturally uh, from, the, from the land and uh, keeping it, you know, as um, pristine, I guess, as, as possible. Some of our biologists have back home have said that that this could be an economic disaster for our fishermen because the fish that few that get get survive and did spawn this year and the next three years in the salmon's life cycle, it it uh, they may not be there to uh, reproduce. And if there was a, only those few that got through this year, that means less and less are going to be there in three years if any come back or whatever. And as uh, tribal people for our area, if the salmon don't survive, we don't survive. Our own community members, I think, is that awareness. It's who we elect. That's a big thing that we do. Again, the legacy of carbon that the United States government has put in our atmosphere, the impact is going to be felt by the tribes. It wasn't the tribes who profited from this. It was the big federal government and the corporations. That adaptation is that we need to understand that we can do something about it, we can adapt, we can survive. Simple thing like we increased heat events in Wisconsin. We have to make sure each and every one of our elders has air conditioning, has a contact, we check on them. Locally, that's where we have to act to make sure that we each survive this. Well, I think the, the local community simply needs to understand that, that we are trying to uh, not only educate the, the general public, but, but our lawmakers, and the community at large about what the effects of climate change really are and how uh, they can help uh, us in our efforts to educate uh, Congress and affect real change.